Stanford University. We're going to jump right back into the demo here at the start of Lecture 10 of Stanford CS193P, spring of 2021. We learned all about multi-threading at the end of the last lecture. And so now we're going to start off this lecture with an emoji art demo that uses multi-threading. Well, now that we're such experts at drag and drop, let's do the drag and drop uh, for our background, right? When we do our background, we want to be able to drag an image in here and drop it from Safari or something. Let's do it that too. That's just the drop. The drag is being done by Safari, so we don't even need an on drag for that, just to on drop. And again, we just needed to say, hey, we're interested in plain text. We get emojis, but I'm also interested in getting uh, URLs and also images. Drop either of those on me. Uh, I'm also interested in those. But of course, if we're going to accept those being dropped on us, well, our drop has to lo look to try and load objects, not just of string, but load objects of UI images and URLs and things like that. So now that we're doing multiple things here, I'm going to create a little var here called found. And just remember that this load objects, it returned whether it was able to load that object. That's why we were able to have our drop return it because this needs to return it. That's what this closure right here requires. So I'm gonna have found equal providers.load objects. And let's start by doing um, URL. So we'll see if we get a URL dropped on us. Then the argument here, instead of being a string, is going to be a URL. Okay, so this is exactly this is exactly the same thing as I was doing here. But here I was looking for a string and getting a string. Now I'm looking for a URL and getting a URL. And now I'm going to change these all to found equals this, found equals this, and at the end I'll refer, return found. Because I'm looking for at least three different things, URLs, strings, and also in the middle here I'm going to be looking for images. Now, if I find a URL, it could not be easier. It's so easy what we do. We just tell our document to set the background to be a emoji art model dot background dot URL of that URL. Okay, remember that dot URL is one of in our uh, art models background dot URL is one of the cases. I'm just create, oops. I'm just creating the case of the URL right here. Now, this is almost right. The only thing is you need to know something tricky about URLs that you drag in from the internet. Sometimes they are wrapped, they wrap the images URL in a bigger URL that's kind of saying where the image is coming from, or, you know, Google or whatever. So there is a well-known way to get it out, which I put a little extension that does this image URL, let's go look at that, down here somewhere, here it is. And it just goes and looks for this component IMG URL equals the actual URL, and this would be embedded in a bigger URL. It doesn't always do this, and if it's not that kind, then it's just gonna return self, the normal URL, but otherwise it's gonna do this little trick. So we do need to make sure we get the right URL. But that's it, and now we're gonna do the exact the same thing here, do another found, but this time for a UI image to see if someone dropped a UI image on us. And of course, we know UI images represents an actual image. That's different from image the view, which draws an image. This UI image is actually an image. So that would be an image in. Okay, so in this one, uh, we got to get the data for the image out of there. So I'm going to say if the data equal that image's JPEG data, and I'm going to do lossless compression there, then document set the background to be dot image data data. And again, I didn't type the emoji art dot background here because Swift can infer this. It knows the argument to set background is an emoji art model dot background. So no need to do that there. And really these other dot founds, I only want to do them if I didn't find this one, because this is the first one. I really would rather find this than the other ones, then second this and then second this. So I'm going to say around these, if not found, then go do this. Because I also don't want them going and looking for those things 
if I've already found something that I want. This also makes it nice if I ever want to add things that I might want to drop, I can just keep adding these not found things all the way through. Okay, we don't have any UI up here. We still have color yellow to draw the background. So for now, let's hop over to our model, uh, our view model over here. And when the set background is called, let's just print it out. So I'm going to say print background set to the background that someone set it to. So we'll just see what's happening. We'll bring up our console down here, see what kind of output we're getting when we drop something. All right, so uh, you probably saw this in the little demo of emoji art I did, but just to explain how we can get two apps side by side at the same time, this little bar down here, we just kind of put our uh, finger down a little bit below just off the screen and drag up and you get this little thing of recent apps that you've used or your little dock over here. And then you can pick this up and just start dragging it. And when you do, you get to place it and you can place it side by side or actually you can place it overlapping like this. Either one is fine. If I drop it in here, they're gonna share the screen equally, but of course you can resize it to make one use less. And these are standard sizes that it will resize to. So I got a bunch of countryside cartoon images here. Uh, that was kind of my go-to uh, kind of image. And so I'm just gonna pick one up, drag it over here. Oh, it's saying plus, green plus looks good, and drop. Did we get anything? Oh, we did, background set to this URL. Woo, excellent. Let's try another one. How about this one right here? Drop. Yeah, look at that, metal border or something like that. Fantastic. Okay, so we're definitely able to do drag and drop. Now we just need to display these things that are being dropped as our background instead of big yellow rectangle here. All right, where's big yellow rectangle? It's in our view. There he is. We need to replace this guy with it. Now I'm going to do this interesting way. I'm going to make this be a white rectangle and I'm gonna overlay on top of it the image, and I'm just gonna use image for this, of the thing that was dropped. And the image has a nice constructor UI image that lets you specify a UI image. Uh, so I'm gonna ask my document, my view model, please give me the background image as an image. So I'm gonna ask my view model to go look in the model over here and look at the background and see if it's a URL. And if it is, go fetch the image for me. Or if it's the data, just make a UI image for me and give it back to me. So this is this kind of role that a view model can have where it is interpreting or helping out the view so that the view code is much simpler. The view just says, give me a background image so I can put it in an image view. So we've got to go implement this var right here. And then where does this image go? Well, it goes in the center. That's one of the great things of having this centered oriented uh, system for all of emojis is that the background goes right in the center. And we know exactly how to put something in the center. Position, convert from emoji coordinates, zero comma zero. That is the center in emoji coordinates. And of course we need the geometry to call this convert method right here. So let's go implement this background image and have our uh, view model do its job here and help us out by doing that. So it's gonna be a published var, of course, because if it changes, we want the view to update itself. We're gonna call it background image and it's gonna be UI image. But actually, now that I think about it, kind of needs to be an optional UI image, doesn't it? Because what if the background is dot blank? then this is nil. Or what if you specify a URL and there's no image there? Then again, ah, this is nil. So this has to be an optional. That's actually gonna cause a problem back here because we have this background image right now, but if we try to build this, value of optional type UI image must be unwrapped. Ah, so if I pass a UI image to image to kind of create it, 
Uh, by the way, if you don't recognize, this is the same image we did system name and created things out of SF symbols. This is just doing UI image instead of system name. Uh, so we can't do an optional here. Uh, this, we could create our own view that does this, and I've done this for you. I called it optional image. Let's go take a look at it in our extension. No, it's actually in utility views. Here it is. It's the simplest view in the world. The body just says, if the UI image is not nil, then do UI image. Otherwise it does nothing. Remember our body is a view builder, so it's allowed to just have an empty view if this if doesn't come true. So that's it. And it takes a UI image as its argument. Super simple. This is hopefully about the simplest view you can possibly imagine here. But it cleans up our code really nicely here because we can say optional image. And if there is no, if this is nil, if there's no image, this is going to be an overlay with nothing on it. So it'll just be a big white square. That's part of the reason I did this white overlay right here. So now let's go back. And how do we set this background image? There's really no way to make it a computed property because this background image might have to be fetched. So if it's fetched, it could take, you know, seconds or a minute on a slow internet. So somehow we have to set this. So when do we need to set this? Well, we need to set this every time the background changes in our model. Okay? If the background changes in our model, then we have to go and change this image right here. So how do we know if the background changes in our model? Well, we can actually use a did set, a property observer up here on our model. And if our model ever changes, it's a value type. So if anything about our model changes, this did set's going to get called. Super valuable, super convenient. And here I'm just going to say, if my emoji art background does not equal the old value of my emoji art background, then I'm going to fetch the background image data if necessary. I might not have to fetch it, but if I do have to fetch it, then I'm going to. So you see we have an error here. Binary operator cannot be applied to two emoji art background operands. Oh no, emoji art background really needs to be equatable. And what's really awesome, Swift can do this for us. We don't have to do that equals equals static func to make it equatable because all, first of all, it knows how to equate enums and then it also knows how to equate URLs and it knows how to equate data. So it automatically does equatable, really cool feature of Swift. So now background is equatable. If we build here, no longer getting that error. So all we need to do now is do this fetch background image if necessary. Let's do that right down here. Private func fetch, now just copy and paste. All right, so what do we need to do to get the background image data? Well, it depends on what the background is. If the background is blank, we don't have to do anything. If it's URL, we gotta go out on the internet and get it, okay? If it's image data, we can just create it directly from the data using UI image. That's really easy. So let's look at all those cases. First, let's set our existing background image to nil because we know the background has changed. So let's blank it out temporarily. And then let's switch on our emoji arts background. And if it's the URL case, then let's get that URL and then fetch the URL. Uh, if it's the image data case, we have the data, then we can set our background image equal to a UI image with that data. So UI image, remember that is an image. It knows how to obviously create an image from like JPEG data or whatever. So this is going to set this background image. Remember, it's published, so that's gonna let the view know and it's gonna redraw and show it. Nice. Otherwise, if it's the blank case, then we just do nothing. Okay, we've already set the background image to nil, so we just break and do nothing here. We need to fetch this URL. And how are we gonna fetch this URL? It's actually a really cool thing in data that will fetch a URL uh, and get its data back. So we just say let image data equal data contents of URL. And this creates a data, a bag of bits, right? 
with the contents of whatever this URL is, and it will go over the internet and get it, which is amazing. Now we have an error here. It says call can throw, but it's not marked with try. We're going to talk a lot about error handling and how it works. We don't use it a lot of times, but here is one place we definitely use it. If you think about this URL, what if we go out on the internet and the internet's not available, our network's down, or we go to a server that is not responding or something like this. So this could easily time out and fail. And when it fails, it throws an error at us. And we have to catch that error. Now, there is a way to ignore the error that's thrown back at us, which is try. <laughs> so let's say, try this. Actually, this is just saying, try this thing. And if it fails, just return nil. This image data could be nil because we tried this, it threw an error, and we just returned nil. It's kind of a nice way to ignore the errors. Now, by just saying, you know, make it be nil, we're not looking at the error, so we don't know if it was a timeout or what the problem was, but in some ways, we don't care. If we can't fetch the data for this URL, then just tell us by giving us nil. We'll learn other ways to do this besides doing this try question mark, uh, but for now, that's what we're gonna do. So we got this data. Now I can just say, if that image data is not nil, so if it, it succeeded, then set my background image to a UI image, which the data is that image data, which we can force unwrap because I just checked to make sure it's not nil right there. That's it. So this actually should work just as is. Both of the cases where there's an image here and here are going to set this background image for us anytime they fetch the background data. And that's gonna happen, this fetching is gonna happen every time the background changes to something else. Perfect, when this is published. That's gonna cause this observed object to notice. Oops, that's gonna invalidate this. This is gonna go down here. We're gonna have do optional image here. This is going to change, this background's gonna change. And so this is going to redraw and we'll get updated. Woohoo, let's try it. Notice the difference already, no big yellow square. We got the white square. Let's pick up one of these and drag it in, drop. And there it is. But man, that took a long time. <laughs> okay, that took a very long time, uh, you know, six seconds or something like that for it to download. And meanwhile, our app was completely frozen. <laughs> there, we couldn't try another one. We can't do anything. Our app was completely stuck. And the reason it was stuck is because this data contents of, while it's wonderful and powerful, it blocks the UI. It blocks the entire app until this thing comes back from the internet. That could be minutes. It could take, I don't know what the time out of this is, but it could be a long time. And so our entire app would just be frozen. Literally, user would be killing our app, swiping up to kill our app and probably uninstalling it as well. So that's no good. That's why we need to do the multi-threaded stuff that we talked about uh, in the slides. So how are we going to make this thing multi-threaded? Well, the first step of it is super easy. We're just going to dispatch queue this thing using a global queue. Here's the quality of service user initiated because the user did initiate this download by dragging and dropping in there. We're going to do asynchronously execute this code right here. This is now going to take this closure and go put it on a queue to run in some other thread, not the main thread. Now we have an error here. It says reference to property background image requires explicit self to make capture semantics explicit. What does that mean? It says reference self explicit. Let's try fix. Oh, it put self dot in front of here. Now we're going to talk about why it did that and whether this fix that we chose is, is okay here. But let's put that off for just a second and go and see if this running in another thread uh, is working. And we'll go grab an image here. Drop. Boom. Oh, well, it worked, but what? Do, I see some purple over here. 
Let's go look at this. Purple error. We've never seen a purple error before. It's always been red or yellow. It says publishing changes from background threads is not allowed. Oh my gosh. Yeah, this is changing the UI and we never change the UI from a background thread. This can only happen on the main thread. This is a super important thing to understand. This is a fantastic feature of Xcode that it gives you this purple warning so that you know it's happening. Because if it didn't warn you and you were doing this, just totally unpredictable things could happen in the UI. So we're not allowed to do this. We can't do something that's going to cause something to be published to cause our UI to rebuild in a background thread. We can only do this in the main thread. So we're not completely stuck right here though. All we need to do is dispatch again. Let's dispatch to the main queue asynchronously and put this code back on the main queue. I've left this try, the thing that goes out on the internet, it's still on this other queue, but when it gets its result, then it puts this closure back on the main queue and runs this code back on the main queue. We won't have this purple problem right here. All right, let's go to the road here. Woo, worked, no purple, excellent. All right, we're not quite done with this multi-threading here though. It's working, but what about this self? Why did it make us put self there, a dot right there? The reason for this is this is a closure and it's a closure that's going to be put in memory and held on to until this thing finishes running. Now, closures are reference types like classes are. This is a class, so our view model is also a reference type, so it lives in memory somewhere. And by putting self dot here, we made this closure, which lives in memory, point to our view model. That's what self dot is doing. That's, that's our view model right there. This is going to keep our view model in memory. Even if someone closed this document, it can't go away. It can't leave the heap because it's being held in the heap by this. So we really don't want this self happening here. So how do we work around this self? Well, there's a little trick you can do in closures. All closures let you do this, which is you can redefine any variable, in this case, ourself, to have a new version of it just inside this closure, which is weak. And what weak means is that it doesn't force this thing, this self in here, to keep this self in the heap. It's weak, but if no one else keeps it in the heap, then if it goes away, it will turn to nil. And so it turns this self in just inside this closure into an optional, which is why this is complaining right here. Value of optional emoji art document question mark must be unwrapped. But we are not going to unwrap it. We're going to question mark it because there's a good chance we come back in here after a five minute search of the internet and this will be nil because they'll have closed the document. So we're gonna use the self question mark. Hopefully again, you're in your reading, you read about optionals. This just means if this is nil, just don't do the rest of this line. And so that's a tricky one. And we're not even done with the trickiness of multi-threading because there's another thing that could happen here. I go out to get this image data. It's taking a long time. The user says, forget it. I'll just drag something else in. And they drag something in from a better server or something and it, it immediately loads because this code will just execute again and immediately load. But then a couple of minutes later, this finally finishes and then this executes. And what's it gonna do? It's gonna blast your background image with the thing you asked for five minutes ago. Even though you already long ago forgot about that because you put something better in there. So when this comes back, we have to check and make sure that this is still the image that the user wants. And this is something about doing asynchronous multi-threaded programming that can take some experience is that whenever you come back from something that might take a long time, you better check to make sure the world is still what you thought it was when it left. Luckily, in our case, this is easy to test. When we come back, we're just gonna check and see if our, and we have to do self again here, emoji art background equals an emoji art model background with a URL that's the same as the URL we just looked up. 
this URL is this URL. Okay, this is a local var this URL here is a local variable to here. And so it cascades, it propagates in. The reason we call these closures is they kind of create a closure of all the symbols that exist in here, all the variables that exist in here. We also say that it captures these, it captures this local variable and keeps it in here so you can reference it. It's capturing self as well, although again, we make it weak, so whew, it, it doesn't keep self in memory. But So as long as the URL is the one we went off to look for is the current one that they want, then we'll go ahead and do this. Otherwise, we'll just ignore this thing that came back. They don't want it anymore. So this kind of multi-threaded programming takes a little getting used to. All right, so let's make sure that still works. All right, here we go. Let's go farm here. Boop, there it is. Okay, again, took quite a while. It's a little annoying that it took a while, but at least our app was uh, still working. Maybe I can do it fast enough if I do this, and then, uh, let's see if I drag in a few of them quickly to see if we can get one that's slow enough. Well, it's kind of hard to do it, but if we had one of these that was really, really slow and we could drag fast enough, we could drag another one in on top of it and it would, it would not load it. And this is another thing about multi-threaded programming, especially in networking, you want to simulate the network being slow. So this call right here, we are going to want to somehow simulate this taking extra time, which I'm not going to cover uh, doing that, but for, there are ways to slow your network down or to put things in here that take a long time, sleep basically, threads sleeping and stuff uh, to slow it down. But again, I'm just trying to introduce you to this concept of multi-threading. We're not trying to turn you into a multi-threaded uh, programming experts. Uh, hopefully you don't need to do a lot of it, but it is important never to block your main thread, so you may have to. Now, one thing that would be nice is if we'd give the user some feedback that we're off doing that loading. And I'm gonna do that with another little published var. I'm gonna call it uh, background uh, image fetch status. It's gonna be a type background image fetch status. And I'm going to have an enum for that. Let's copy and paste. And this enum is just going to have an idle case. And it's going to have a fetching case where I'm either idle or I'm fetching. So we'll start. This will always start out, obviously, in the dot idle case. And then when we're fetching the background here, just before we go off and fetch it, we'll set our background image fetch status to fetching and then when it comes back and it's one that we're interested in here we'll set our background image fetch status to idle so now we have a published var that's telling us the status of the fetching that's going on in here and we can use this published var in our ui what i'm going to do here is i'm going to have my background here uh, the image will be nil while i'm fetching that's good i'm going to say if my documents background image fetch status equals fetching, then I'm going to put up what's called a progress view. So progress view built into Swift UI. When you just use it with no arguments, it makes a little spinning wheel, but it can be used for a lot of different progress measuring, loading up files and all kinds of things. And I'm also not going to show my emoji if I'm in the middle of downloading like this. It's as simple as that. This will automatically change. This is a published var, so this will just automatically happen each time we try and load. Well, we got an error here. Oh, yeah, again, self dot. All right, let's try image here with this one. Oops, see the little spinner? So it's has been there, huh? This one, spinner. Yeah, spinner, spinner. Right. Now, maybe we want that spinner to be a little bigger. It's really easy to do. We would just say our progress view dot scale effect times two or something like that to make it bigger. 
But again, we have our view model essentially doing its job over here of helping the view to have all the information it needs to do to draw itself. Our other topic of today is gestures. Gestures are all about getting input from the user. And SwiftUI has very powerful primitives for recognizing gestures that are made by the user's fingers. Those gestures, we call them multi-touch gestures because multiple fingers can be involved, pinches and things like that at the same time. And Swift UI pretty much takes care of all the recognizing of the gesture. In other words, it notices the two fingers have gone down, it notices they're getting closer together, and so it says, oh, I see a pinch. Your job is to handle the gestures. In other words, to decide what to do when that pinch starts to happen. To cause your view to start recognizing a certain gesture, all you need to do is use this gesture view modifier. The gesture view modifier just takes one argument, which is anything that conforms to the gesture protocol. And there's a bunch of built-in gestures that SwiftUI provides that implement this protocol that you can use to do gestures. And you could do your own gestures, although that would really be advanced use of gestures, definitely beyond the scope of this course. So how do I create a concrete gesture, something that implements this protocol? Well, we're just going to usually have a func or a var in our view that creates it. It might even just be a local variable at the top of our var body if it, we have a very simple uh, gesture going on there. Here, for example, I've used a computed var called the gesture. And notice its type is some gesture. And we know what some means. Some means go look inside the curly braces there and find out which one I'm returning and make that be my type. So here I'm creating a tap gesture. And so that's going to be the type of my the gesture var here. Notice also that I've passed an argument to tap gesture there, count to. So this is actually a double tap gesture. Now Swift will, just with these two lines of code, the one at the top, and this bar down at the bottom, it will start recognizing double tap gestures. Of course, it's not gonna do anything because we haven't told Swift UI what to do when this happens. So how do we do something when a gesture happens? Well, it kind of depends on what kind of gesture it is. There's a whole category of gestures that are non-discrete, like drags and magnification gesture, like at the pinch gesture, et cetera. But then there's like tap gesture, and also long press gesture, which can be treated as discrete. They either happen or they didn't happen. So those are the easiest to handle. So let's just get those out of the way. Tap gesture, for example, our little double tap. We just do a gesture modifier. It's a little function, kind of looks like a view modifier, but of course we're modifying a gesture there. So a little gesture modifier on ended. It just takes a closure. You can do something, do whatever you want in there. And that's it. So it could not be simpler. And because it's so simple, usually we're going to use the view modifiers like on tap gesture, which we've already seen, although we didn't pass that count argument to it. We could have. And then we just do something. So we've already done that in this class. You already know how to do discrete gestures. It's just so easy. But let's talk about non-discrete gestures because there is definitely some stuff to learn here. In non-discrete gestures, you get to handle not only the fact that the gesture was recognized and that it ended, so a pinch happened, and now the pinch is over. Definitely still want to be able to detect that. But you also might want to get involved as the pinch is happening. Fingers are moving together, they're moving apart. And it's the kind of gestures that are non-discrete are, of course, that pinch, also drag, dragging things across the screen. Rotation, that's kind of like a pinch gesture, two fingers down, but then you turn the fingers kind of like a dial. And long press gesture, which I said could be discrete, it can also be non-discrete. You hold your finger down and it's updating as the finger's being held down, maybe it's moving a little bit. And then when you lift up the long press gesture, it ends. Okay, so it can also be a non-discrete gesture. You get to do the unended, works fine for non-discrete gestures. You almost always do want to do something in unended. Now, in unended of a non-discrete gesture, you're going to get this argument, this pink or magenta, whatever that is, uh, value passed to you. And that value, it depends on what kind of gesture you're doing. If it's a drag gesture, it's actually a pretty complicated struct that has the start and end location of the fingers and things like that. 
If it's a magnification gesture, a pinch gesture, it's actually very simple. I think it's just a CG float with how big or far or close the fingers have moved. Uh, for a rotation gesture, I think it's just an angle. Remember our angle struck that we use? I think it's an angle that tells you. But you have to go look in the documentation at the gesture and see what it's going to pass you there. But the big difference for non-discrete gesture is that you also get a chance to do something while the gesture is in flight, while it's actually happening. And when what the, basically the way this works is you get to define some state, it's totally up to you, and then we're gonna update this state as the gesture goes on. This state, which you get to define, is stored in a specially marked var at sign gesture state, which looks a lot like at sign state and it's very similar to at sign state but it's not quite we're going to explain why that is and this thing can be any type you want this could be a cg float it could be your own struct it, it's really unlimited as to what this thing can be and so you can store whatever information in there you need for your view to update itself and redraw itself while the gesture is going on. And remember that you're gonna be given the opportunity to update this state repeatedly over and over as the gesture is going on. In a drag, maybe here you just store how far the finger has moved. That's maybe all you need to know. But you might know, need to know other information like where the finger is right now. That's another thing you could get uh, from the drag. But it's totally up to you what you wanna store. In red here, and very important to notice that this var will return to that starting value. You see the starting value up there? That you must specify that because this is always gonna to return to that when the gesture is not happening. When the gesture is not in flight, this bar always has that starting value. So this data, whatever you decide you're gonna update while the thing's in motion, it's only for when it's in motion. So this var, believe it or not, is actually read only to you, except that you're given this really narrow window in which you're allowed to update this state while the gesture is happening. So let's see how that happens. This is another gesture modifier here, just like on ended, it's called dot updating. And there's a lot of things going on there, a lot of different colors, get the magenta and the blue. And so let's go through what each of these things is. This updating function, whatever closure you provide there, it has all those arguments. It's called repeatedly as the fingers move. Now that dollar sign you see at the beginning there, that is just something you're always gonna put there. I'm gonna explain next week when we talk about property wrappers, what that dollar sign is. But for now, just need you need to know you're gonna put that dollar sign there. And it's, you're putting it in front of my gesture state there, which is your gesture state, the, your at sign gesture state bar, that goes there. So here, that, that dollar sign, my gesture state, you're telling the system which gesture state to use. Because you could have multiple at sign gesture state bars, you know, for different gestures or whatever. And so this is telling the system which one of them goes along with this particular drag gesture that we're doing right here. So don't forget the dollar sign there when you're doing that. This closure then that has those three arguments, value, my gesture state, and transaction, that closure is being called repeatedly as the fingers move around and the gesture uh, progresses there. The value argument to that closure is the same value argument to Alan ended. So it depends on which gesture it is. Sometimes it's a simple CG float if it's pinch gesture, remember, start location, end location if it's a drag, etc. So that's the same information, and it's giving you the current information about the fingers. Okay, that's what value is. So you definitely need that if you're going to update your state. Uh, the second thing right there, that my gesture state, that's an in-out parameter that lets you modify your own at sign gesture state var. Because otherwise that at sign gesture state var variable, it's read only to, you don't really own it. The gesture handling system owns that, but it's giving you this little window in dot updating here to update it with using an in out parameter. Now an in out parameter, hopefully you read about that in your reading. It's just a var that uh, its value gets copied in to the closure there and you can change it in the closure and then it'll get copied out. So 
the gesture system copies the value of your current gesture state into there. You can change it based on that value, whatever the value is telling you about what's going on in the gesture, and then it will automatically copy it back out. So that's how it allows you to change your at sign gesture state there, uh, even though normally it would be read only. So this is the only place you can change your at sign gesture state is in this little uh, closure right here with the dot updating gesture modifier. There's a third argument there in yellow, transaction. You see that? That has to do with animation. And we just don't have time to talk about that. I'm sorry about that. Uh, didn't make the cut for things we're going to talk about. Most of the time, you do not need it. You already know so much about animation. Uh, and all the things you know, 90% of animation, you usually don't need to know about transactions. So this all seems like it might be a little bit complicated. And uh, I, some, I know that in the past, students have been a little confused by this. But really, this whole updating thing is just about giving you that blue value thing and letting you update your own state, your at sign gesture state, to whatever you want based on what that value is. And it's repeatedly letting you do that as the fingers move. That's what's going on here. So when you're designing how you handle your gestures, you need to think about what state would be changing in my view. What state might I need to draw my view as those fingers pinch together or drag across the screen? And you need to make a struct for that or whatever. Or if it's just a CG float, that's fine. You mark it outside gesture state, and then you can update it right here as the gesture happens. Now, there is a simpler version of this uh, updating thing called on changed. Notice it only gives you the value. Well, if it only gives you the value, you are not going to be able to update state based on things like how far this thing has moved and things like that. You're going to need to just look at the current state of the fingers and draw your view based on the current state of the fingers. And sometimes you can. Sometimes you look at the current state of the fingers and you just you can draw your view. Uh, like, for example, you're dragging to select. And wherever the fingers started and ended there, you can look and see which objects on the screen intersect that rectangle, maybe. Or um, you're using your finger like a pen to draw or something like that. So there are cases where you don't really have any state to update each time the fingers move. But a lot of times you do have state because, uh, you know, if you're doing a pinch, it, there's state about, you know, how much your view has been scaled or whatever. And you're going to see this one in emoji art. We're going to use the updating version because we need to scale our view. So that's the overview of it. But let's go into the demo and see this in action. Uh, we're going to make our whole document in Emoji Art be zoomable but pinching and also repositionable. We can move it around using a drag gesture. Before we add a few gestures to our uh, Emoji Art document view here, let's take a quick review of what we've done so far, which is we've created the body of our document view, which is a V stack with the document at the top and a palette of emojis to choose from at the bottom. And this palette, really simple little view down here, a scrolling emojis view. We're passing these test emojis into there. And it just creates a scrolling view, a horizontal stack of texts, which are all draggable. The document on top of that, its body is pretty simple also. It's just a big white rectangle. And laid on top of it is this optional image, which is really just image, but we handle the fact that this might be nil. And this is our document giving us the background image from our model, which it might have fetched it from the internet for us using multi-threaded. That's great. And we're positioning it here in, at 0, 0 in the emoji art coordinate system, which we know 0, 0 is the middle in that coordinate system. And the only other thing in our document right now is either a spinning view here, a progress view, if we're currently in the process of fetching, or it's our emojis. We're just for eaching through our documents emojis, creating a text for each one, and setting the size of it and positioning it based on the information that's in our model. And of course, we allow dropping of things onto our document, including plain text things. That's the little emojis we dragged out of that uh, uh, palette below. And we also allow the dropping of URLs and images to try and set 
the background. We handle these drops in this little function that we wrote right here. It handles drops of URLs and images by just setting the background in our view model, which is going to set the background in our model. And it handles strings being dropped on it by calling this add emoji in our view model. And when we add the emoji, of course, we have to convert from wherever the drop happened inside of our view to emoji coordinates, that zero, zero centered thing. So we do these converts down here to and from really simply by just finding our own center and then finding the offset from the center. Our font size right now, we're just making it be the emoji size as a float. And the position that we put our emojis, very simple. We're just converting from the emoji coordinate space to our own coordinate space. That's it. That's all we have so far. The next thing we want to do is add some gestures. The first gesture I'm going to do is a simple one, just going to be a double tap on the background to zoom in on our document. And double tap is going to zoom it so that the background perfectly fits. So if we have our app over here, give ourselves a background. This background's a little too big and it kind of spilling outside. If I double tap here, it's going to shrink it down to perfectly fit in here and similar, something like this. And it, this almost fits actually, it's almost a perfect fit. But if I double tap on it, it's just gonna make it a little bit wider to fit there. So the main thing this double tap needs is a function that zooms our document to fit its available space. So let's go down and write that function first. Let's put this right here in front of the palette. I'm gonna call this private func zoom to fit some image, a UI image, which I'm gonna to allow to be optional here in size, CG size, that is the size of our view. And inside here, uh, the reason I'm going to let this be nil is because I want to be able to just call zoom to fit on my background image, which might be nil. If I have the dot blank background, I could have a nil uh, background image. So I want that to be able to be nil. But inside here, I'm just going to do nothing if that's nil. And I'm going to do that. There's a lot of ways to do that. I'm going to do it by saying if let image equal image. This is, seems like kind of a strange little piece of code, and, and it is, and some people stylistic wouldn't, stylistically uh, wouldn't really like this that much. There's another way we can do this with a guard keyword. We could guard to protect against that image being nil, but I'm going to try to throw different variety of ways to handle these things. We could also say if image does not equal nil and then force unwrap it inside here. Uh, we'll maybe see guard a little later in the quarter. Now, I'm not only going to check to see if the image is nil, I'm going to make sure the image is not zero size, and also that our size is not zero. Our, our view size probably is never going to be zero, but uh, we'll check just to make sure there's no zeros in here. So I'm going to say image.size.width, that's the size of the uh, image. This is just a var in the UI image data structure. And I'm going to make sure that that's greater than zero. I'm going to say image.size.height is greater than zero. I'm going to say my own size.width is greater than zero and my own size.height is greater than zero. So we have work to do if uh, all of this is true. And so what in here are we going to do? Sizing it to fit might be a horizontal sizing requirement or a vertical sizing requirement, kind of whichever is smaller of those two, because I want the whole image to fit. So let's figure out what the zoom would be in the horizontal direction. I'll call it H zoom. That's just our size dot width divided by our image size dot width. And in the vertical direction, V zoom is our size dot height divided by our image size dot height. So I need to take the smaller of these two. I'm going to store the result in a variable called zoom scale, which is going to be quite important in our app here. And I'm going to say, just make that the minimum of these two zoom factors. So by picking the minimum of these two, I'm guaranteeing that the whole image will fit. Now, what is this zoom scale here? I'm going to create my own little at sign state because I'm going to set this bar right here. So it has to be at sign state, private var zoom scale. It's going to be a CG float. I'm going to start it out equal to one. Now we are seeing a use of at sign state here. We know it's like, ah, we're not supposed to use at sign state that much, but it really makes sense here. 
because how much we're zoomed in on our document is not part of our model. It has nothing to do with our model. It really is just a temporary situation in how we're displaying ourselves right now and exactly what at sign state is, something just local to our view. It only has to do with how our view is displaying. Now the meaning of this zoom scale is just how much we're gonna scale our document up or down. So if this is two, then our document's gonna be twice as big as its normal size. If it's 0.5, it's gonna be half as big. If I have this zoom scale variable, I have to go throughout all my code here that might be affected by our being zoomed in or not. Because when we're zoomed in, you know, our coordinate system is showing the image much larger and all the emojis are like farther from the center. So there's a lot different about being zoomed in or being zoomed out. So let's go through all of our code and apply this zoom scale to anything that might be affected. And we're gonna start with a simple obvious thing, which is our background. Our background clearly wants to be scaled by this zoom scale. The more we're zoomed in, the bigger we want our background image to be. And of course, the exact same thing with our little emojis. We want our little emojis to scale to whatever our zoom scale is as well. But that's not quite enough to just scale up our background and our emojis because you notice down here, we're converting to and from our documents coordinate system. And just imagine that we were zoomed way in. Well, now a far distance from middle is not a very big distance from in the you know, emoji art coordinate system. It's a lot in ours because we're so zoomed in so big that everything is huge, but here it's not. So we have to adjust this conversion to and from emoji coordinates to deal with the fact that we're zoomed in. So for example, when we're converting from emoji coordinate systems, we're moving out from our center by that much, but we have to move out by that much times the zoom scale. So we have to move out farther when we have some zoom going on. And similar the other way around, when we're seeing how far are we from our center, we're gonna to have to divide that by our zoom scale because we're zoomed way in, well, we're not as far as it looks like we are. We need to do that. So that's the obvious thing that gets affected by zoom is converting to and from our model's coordinate system. And the only other thing I think we might wanna do is when we drop an emoji, we're already converting to emoji coordinates, so that's not gonna be a problem. It'll drop it in the right place. But the size of the thing, I think it might be a little nicer if we divide the size of the emoji by our zoom scale. And this way, if we're zoomed way in, our huge zoom, then when we drop this emoji, it'll keep its same size because we're gonna shrink it down. In other words, when you drop an emoji on something that's zoomed way in, the emoji is going to be really small. But if you drop it on, you're zoomed way out and you drop an emoji in, then the emoji will be really big. So that, yeah, that's a way to kind of trickily uh, control the size of the emojis as you drag them in. So we'll do that and you'll see how that works. It's kind of fun. That's, that's about it, I think. I don't think anything else is affected by uh, zooming in or out. So now that we have this zoom scale, it's like a big knob that we've added to our emoji uh, art document view so we can just zoom in and out. And zoom to fit is using that knob right here to make the background perfectly fit. Now all we need to do is add a gesture to call this zoom to fit. Again, I'm going to use double tap for that. And specifically, I'm going to make it so that you it does that when you double tap on this background overlay. When you double tap on the background, it's going to do this. If you double tap on an emoji, maybe I want to save that to mean something else. But if you double tap on this, it's going to do it. So where you add a gesture view modifier matters, okay? Because whatever view you add it to, that's the view that is going to start recognizing whatever gesture you put in here. And what gesture do we want in here? I'm going to create a little function. I'm going to call it uh, double tap to zoom. And that thing is going to need to know our geometry's uh, size because when it zooms in, it's going to double tap to zoom is going to be calling this zoom to fit. And that wants to know, well, OK, well, what size you want to fit uh, this thing in? And of course, we're going to be passing our background image here into this. So that's good. So I'm just going to go and implement this little function right here. Double tap to zoom. Let's put it down uh, again near all this stuff. Private funk double tap to zoom and we said it took a size 
and it's supposed to return some gesture, right? This right here was the argument to this gesture view modifier. So this must be some gesture. This has to be some gesture in here. So some gesture, we know that some will look inside of our code, figure out what it is. I'm just going to say tap gesture with a count of two. And this, you know, we know there's implicit return right here. So I'm returning a tap gesture. It's going to know that that's what I'm returning. It's going to make the type of this be tap gesture. And this is going to do what it's supposed to do, which is return a gesture. Now, as soon as I do this, as we said in the slides, it's going to start recognizing tap gestures, but double tap gestures here. But it's not going to do anything until we tell it what to do with on ended. And that's when the second finger up of the tap comes up. It's going to call this little function right here, and we can do anything we want. And of course, what we want to do is the zoom to fit. Zoom to fit. Our background image is the image that we want to do. So that's our document's background image, which might be nil, but that's okay. We handle nil, remember, down here, no problem. And in size, the size, of course, is this size that was passed in. That was our geometry size. And that's all it takes to do discrete gestures. Discrete gestures, very simple uh, gestures to add. So let's take a look at this. All right, let's drag something out here. How about this guy? And there's our background. Now it's a little too big. So I'm going to double tap on this and hopefully it should shrink down. Well, it did. Now there's a little jerky, herky jerky there. Kind of jumped. Let's go try another one, see what it looks like. Double tap. Nice. How about this one? Double tap. So we know how to fix herky jerky. No problem. I'm just going to go in here and on end it. I'm going to say with animation, do this. So it's going to still do that zoom to fit, which is going to cause us to get resized. But it's going to do it with a little bit of animation just to make it a little smoother. All right, let's grab our favorite one right here. We're going to double tap. That was nice and smooth. But this one right here. Oh, by the way, I see something here I don't like very much. Look at this image. It smashes all over. It's smashing underneath our little scrolling here, which maybe I want that, but I have a feeling once I start having the palette control and I can select multiple of them, it's going to look a little funny to be floating on top. But when we go back, let's also make it so that this does not draw outside of its space that it's been granted. Remember, this is a V stack with our document body here and our palette here. And it's still, this is its view, but views by default are allowed to draw outside themselves. And that's exactly what it's doing here. It's drawing outside, but it's a really simple way to keep them in control. And we're gonna do that. But let's check the double tap with this, ready? Double tap. Zoop. Okay, so animation, almost always a good thing, especially when the user does a gesture. Very often we might want to uh, animate if we're doing something that's moving things around on screen. But we're also gonna add another gesture when we go back, which is pinching. So pinching, and I'm showing you this, you see these two little gray dots. This is happening because I'm holding down the option key in the simulator. Of course, on a device, these would be my fingers. But uh, pinching, you can go here and just pinch, and that should make our image smaller. Or if I go and, uh, apart, then it should make my image larger. So I want that pinch to control the zooming, not just double tap to zoom, but I want to be able to pinch to control it. And so let's add that clipping thing to keep that in check, and then we'll add a zoom gesture. All right, the clipping couldn't be simpler. We've got our geometry reader all up here. And all we're going to do to make this work is add a single little view modifier here, dot clipped. So if you put dot clipped on a view, it says stay inside your space. Don't go outside the rectangle that you chose for yourself during the layout process. Now, if we run,
and let's drag out this offending background. It gets clipped. It's not drawing behind anymore. So that gives us some nice space down here to work with our palette. All right, zooming with a pinch. To do zooming with a pinch, we need another gesture. Just like we have a double tap to zoom that returns some gesture, we're going to need some sort of private funk or var. Probably could be a var. I'm gonna make it a funk gesture. And it's gonna return some gesture. So this is going to be the gesture that does the pinching magnification gesture it's called. And just like double tap to zoom, we can have on ended here. But the difference with this one is that we get a little var that gets passed to us, which is the gesture scale at the end. And we can use this gesture scale at the end to update our zoom scale, for example. We could say zoom scale times equals the gesture scale at the end. So gesture scale at end is just a CG float, and it's really telling you how far the fingers are apart compared to what they started. So if they're the same distance apart, this gesture scale at end would be one. If the fingers are twice as far apart, this gesture scale at end would be two. If they were half as far apart, it would be 0.5. So we're taking whatever our current scale is and we're multiplying it by that scale. So if you had your fingers twice as far apart, our scale is now gonna be twice what it was before. Makes perfect sense. Now, how do we add this zoom gesture? Again, the same way we added this double tap to zoom. And I'm gonna add this gesture to my entire Z stack here. Let's say dot gesture, my zoom gesture. And that's really all that's required to start this thing recognizing and at least doing that on end part of this. Let's see what this looks like so far. Let's drag out favorite background here. And double tap still works. But now we can hold down the option key in the simulator to simulate our two fingers. And oh, I, I'm pinching. Oh, and it actually is working. Look, make it smaller, can make it larger, but it's really jumpy. And just adding with animation is not going to fix this because we have to be actually updating our zoom while this pinch is happening. If we want it to be redrawing, we have to be doing it while it's going on, not just when it ends, come in here and end, not just at that time, we need it as it's, the fingers are moving. So this is a non-discrete gesture. It's a gesture where we're getting involved as it's unfolding. So how are we going to do that? Well, anytime we're gonna do a non-discrete gesture like this, the number one thing we need to think about is what state is changing while we're pinching. And in our case, it's our zoom scale, except it's our zoom scale modified by how much we've pinched so far. It's not absolute, you know, we don't put the two fingers down and then as soon as we start pinching, our zoom scale moves to be that. And we also can't have it that every time the fingers move, we multiply our zoom scale by the scale of the fingers because then we would get exponential growth as we zoomed out and exponential shrinking as we moved in. So that's not it either. Really, during the pinch, we just need to keep track of how much that pinch has pinched and then multiply that much times the zoom scale that we started with. This is why we need another piece of state, which we're gonna mark as gesture state, because this state is only going to exist while the gesture is going on. So I'm gonna call this my gesture zoom scale. And it's the scale of the fingers only while the pinch is happening. All other times, this is going to be one. In other words, don't scale it bigger or smaller. This is like a temporary var. This var is also essentially read only to our view. There's only one chance we're gonna get, as we saw in the slides, to change it, but otherwise it's read only. Now this is still the actual zoom scale of my document, but it's kind of the steady state zoom scale. Right, this is the zoom scale I have when I'm not gesturing in the steady state of this app. 
I'm going to actually rename this to steady state zoom scale just to be clear that it's what it is. But I only want to do that in the places where I'm setting the zoom scale, like in the zoom gesture, of course, when it ends, but also when I'm doing zoom to fit. In the places where I'm using the zoom scale, when I'm doing my conversions or when I'm scaling uh, my uh, background or emojis here, I actually want to use a combination of both the steady state zoom scale and the gesture zoom scale. And that way, while the gesture zoom scale is happening, these things will be showing the combination of the two. So I'm gonna create another little private var here, which I'm gonna call zoom scale again, and it's gonna be a CG float. And it's just going to be the steady state zoom scale times the gesture zoom scale. So zoom scale that we read, that we use to do all our calculations is a combination of the two. Now remember, this here is only one when the gesture is not going on. So it's really gonna have no effect on my steady state zoom scale here, right? It's gonna be steady state zoom scale times one. So that's good. But when the gesture is happening, now this is telling me how much pinch there is, right? The fingers twice as far apart or whatever. So my zoom scale is gonna be zoomed up by two when the fingers are twice as far apart. And then when my zoom gesture finally ends, I'm going to set this steady state zoom scale to be multiplied by whatever that final position of the fingers is. And that's going to update the steady state. This is going to go back to one because the gesture is going to be over and we will have gotten our new zoom scale. So that is how this all works. Now, this is great, except we need to add this very important gesture modifier called updating. And updating takes only one argument, which is dollar sign, and then the name of your gesture state that you want to essentially track what's going on with this gesture. So I'm just putting this name right here in here with a dollar sign in the front. And again, next week, we'll talk about what this dollar sign is. But for now, just do it, just put it there. And we get three arguments here. The most important argument we get is the latest gesture scale in the slides this was my blue value argument and this is exactly the same kind of argument as here it's just this is the latest one because we're going to be called repeatedly here this is going to be over and over calling this closure and it's going to be telling you how far the fingers are apart okay, twice as far half as far as they move it's constantly telling you that so obviously you need this if you're gonna be updating your gesture zoom scale uh, each time. And that is the goal of this little closure is just to update this. And this is your only opportunity to update this. Otherwise, like I said, it's mostly read only here. And you update it in a kind of a strange way. You're gonna use this in out parameter here, which a descriptive name for it would be our gesture state in out style. And then we have this transaction talk about that in a second. So this is an in out parameter. It's the kind of parameter where the value is copied in, you can change it in here, and then whatever you change it to will be copied back out. And so the whole gesture system is using this to allow you to change your zoom scale. So inside here, we would say our gesture state in out equals whatever new value we wanted it to have. Now, this can be confusing because in out parameters, we rarely use them in Swift. So uh, you may not have seen them before in other languages. A lot of times because of that, this is a little confusing. We'll actually call this our gesture zoom scale. In other words, you will use the same name for this argument as for this var. And then it looks like that we're just changing our gesture zoom scale in here. But this var is not exactly the same as this. It's the in out version. It's being passed in and out through here. But if you want to think of it this way, if this is bending your brain, you're not really understanding what's going on here with this in out, you can just kind of assume that you get to change your, your gesture state here if you call it the same name. So you have the same name here, here, and here now. So what is our gesture zoom scale in here? Well, it's just the latest gesture scale. Whatever the pinch, fingers are doing, that is our gestures zoom scale. So if the pin fingers are twice as far apart, then our gesture zoom scale is two. And since 
we're using this zoom scale computed var everywhere, it's going to include that whenever the gesture is going on. When the gesture is not going on, it's not, it's one, so it has no effect. That's it. I it took great pains to kind of go through this. Hopefully you understand all the pieces of this puzzle right here. When you're designing gesture code, the most important thing is to understand what state is actually changing while the gesture is in flight. And this can be anything. I made this be a CG float, which just happens to be the same thing that is passed to us while this is happening at the end. But it could be something else. For example, in your homework, in the extra credit, you know, if you do the extra credit, you need a little bit more information about the emojis that are being moved around. And so this is going to be more than just a simple CG float or something like that. It's going to maybe be a tuple or some little struct or something. Um, all right, so that's enough. Let's go take a look. All right, here we go. Drag this in here. And I'm going to hold down Option and Pinch. Ooh, see, as I'm moving these fingers, it is changing that gesture scale state, and that's being multiplied by our steady state zoom. And when I let go, now the steady state zoom has been set to this new zoom value. And again, I can still double tap to zoom it out and then resize. All right, so we're gonna do one more thing, which is if I zoom way in, uh, what if I wanted, uh, I want that tree. I wanna put an apple on that tree or something. Here's an apple, I wanna put it on that tree. I can't reach it. Uh, so we're gonna make it so that you can put your finger down and drag over and it will pull this tree out into the space where we can actually edit. So that is called a drag gesture. By adding a drag gesture, hopefully it, we're, it's gonna look exactly the same pretty much as doing the zoom. And by seeing it twice, hopefully you'll get an idea how this stuff all works. All right, let's go do that. Now we're gonna, we're gonna be doing exactly the same pattern here, just with a different kind of gesture. So I still need a steady state one and a basically drag state as things are going on. So let's copy and paste these actually. We'll put this up here. But this is gonna be my steady state, uh, I'll call it pan offset, because this is for panning around in the view. I could call it maybe drag offset or something, but you know, when you're using your finger to move around to something, we usually call that panning, panning around in it. And so I have the steady state and the one in the gesture. So I'll also have a private bar pan offset, CG size. Oh, that's right. Our offsets here are not CG floats. They're going to be CG sizes because there's an offset in the width direction and an offset in the height direction as well. And this is going to be the steady state pan offset plus the gesture pan offset. Now, this code that I'm doing right here, this plus, is not actually something you can do on sizes. This is a size. This is a size. Yeah, we'll need a better thing there. Uh, you can't really add sizes, but I like to add sizes. So in my extensions over here in CG size, I actually added plus. So you, it's possible to add plus to any type you want. And you just do a static func plus, and then the left-hand side and the right-hand side or whatever you want. So I even allowed multiplying a size times a float. So for times, you can multiply a size times two and it'll get twice as big a size. I like this, I think it looks nice. It makes it so that back here in our code, it's pretty obvious what I'm doing here. I'm adding these two offsets to each other. Uh, but again, we normally we would have had to create a new CG size where the width is the width of this plus the width of this and the height of that plus the height of that. Would have been a lot more code. This is much cleaner and easier to read. So yeah, we don't want a size of one. There's no such thing. So what is our steady state offset? Well, it's a offset of zero. The CG size is just a struct. This is just a var, static var, uh, a zero. This is a zero size. And same thing here. When we are not panning, remember, when we're not panning, we're not doing that gesture, this is going to be the value of this bar. So we want it to be zero, and that's good because when we're not panning, we want our pan offset to just be our steady state pan offset. It's be plus zero, so it won't do anything. One little bit of trickiness that you don't want to forget here is that when we're panning around and we're zoomed, 
we have to move a little farther here. Okay, if we're zoomed in. So I'm going to take this and multiply this times my zoom scale so that my pan offset, how much I'm going to move my view around, is increased if my zoom scale is greater than one and decreased if my zoom scale is less than one. All right, we understand that. So now I've got this nice pan offset, just like we went with zoom scale and we applied it to all the places that could be affected by zooming in and out, we have to do the same thing that, to all the places that could be affected by having the, an offset being panned over to the left or right or up or down. So that's certainly going to affect our conversions right here. Absolutely no doubt about that. So when we're converting two emoji coordinates, we have to take the location here, but we have to subtract not just from the center, but we have to get that pan offset out of there too. So the pan offsets width. And same thing here, the pan offset, oops, I got to line this already, pan offset dot height. I'm gonna make sure I include it there. And then when we're going the other direction down here, we just have to do our little conversion and then add our pan offset dot width. That way we're converting from Moji coordinate system. They go out from the middle by some amount that gets scaled up and then dragging it with the, uh, finger and that's going to cause it to move over a little bit more or move up a little bit more or down a little bit. So we have to add that in there. The other thing I decided I wanted to do is when I double tap to zoom and I do this zoom to fit and we scale it, let's have it jump to the middle. And I can do that by setting my steady state pan offset here to dot zero, CG size dot zero. And again, we can have Swift infer the CG size part right here. And that's gonna reset it, not only scale it to fit, but to zoom it back to the middle. Obviously we want it back in the middle. So we've built the infrastructure here for panning with our steady state and then the pan that happens during a gesture. So now all we need to do is the same kind of thing we did here. We need an on ended where we update our pan offset to however much our finger moved. And we are gonna need updating here to be changing our gesture state to reflect how much we've moved so far during this drag gesture. So just like we had a zoom gesture, we're going to need a private func for our pan gesture. And it's gonna return some gesture. What kind of gesture do we use for panning? It's called a drag gesture. And our drag gesture, of course, wants on-ended. Now, what's interesting about on-ended, this gives you, I'm gonna call this final drag gesture value. This final drag gesture is much more complicated than what we got for the zoom. For the zoom, it was a CG float that was telling us the scaling of the fingers. So to understand better what this value is, let's go take a look at the documentation for drag gesture. There it is, a little summary of it here. And let's go and look at it in more detail. And you can see the drag gestures can be uh, created and they also have some parameters like minimum distance, right? Just like tells you how far you have to start dragging before it really thinks it's a drag. Uh, it's kind of can tune your drag to feel a little more responsive or give opportunity to recognize some other gesture going on there. And here's things you're used to updating, on changed, on ended. And you'll see all of these, they take a self.value, right? On ended, self.value, self.value. And here is that self.value. The struct value, what is it? Click. Oh, it's got all kinds of information about what's going on with this drag, like where it is in your views coordinate system. These predicted things are if you're moving it pretty fast and you let go of the finger, it gives a little bit of extra velocity to it. It doesn't have the end point be exactly where your finger went up. It gives you a little bit of extra room there, which is kind of natural and kind of cool. Uh, there's the start location, there's the time that it last happened. And there's also this translation. This translation is the width and height since the start of the uh, gesture, which is exactly what we want because we're panning our thing around. We want to update our state to essentially be this translation right here. So let's go back and do exactly that. We to update our state right here, steady state in this case, because it's the ended. So we want to update our steady state. I'm going to set my steady state pan offset equal to my current steady state pan offset plus this 
final drag gesture values translation divided by my zoom scale though because if I'm zoomed way in such my document is really big and I move my finger across the screen I'm not actually moving it that far through the document right because I'm zoomed way in so that my document is huge so I have to divide that translation how much my finger moved by that zoom scale and of course we want our drag gesture to show itself while it's going we need to do an updating here and the updating argument is a dollar sign and then the gesture state variable that we are using which is this one right here gesture pan offset and the arguments to this thing are the latest drag gesture value this one was the final gesture value this is the latest one as we're moving the finger around and then I'm going to call this my gesture pan offset. In other words, I'm going to call this variable the same name as this. Of course, we know this is actually an in out parameter, but just for kind of ease of understanding the code, I'm going to call it the same name. And then we have that transaction. Uh, by the way, I didn't. I was told you I was going to say something about transaction down here, and I didn't, but there's nothing to say because we're not going to talk about transactions. And if you have a closure like this and you're not going to use an argument, that's a good idea to just throw an underbar in there. Same thing down here. We don't use it to underbar it. That way no one thinks that maybe we intended to use it and we didn't. We are basically telegraphing here. Yeah, we're not doing anything with the transaction. We're not doing anything special about animation in here. Now, while we're updating, here we and we're ended, we're updating the steady state, but when we're updating, we're updating our gesture state only. So set our gesture pan offset equal to this latest drag gesture values translation divided by our zoom scale. Same thing as we did down here, however much we're moving with our drag gesture. If we're zoomed in, we need to cut it down. And if we're zoomed out, of course, we'll be dividing by a number less than one here. We need to crank it up a little bit. So now we have a pan gesture, just like we had a zoom gesture down here. Now, the interesting thing about the pan gesture is that I'm going to add it to the Z stack as well. But I generally don't want to do something like this. This might work. Uh, you know, prob the gesture recognition system is going to tr probably try and recognize this one first, maybe. It's not really clear, but gesture wants you to be clearer about this by using a function in gesture called simultaneously with. So I'm going to have this pan gesture recognized simultaneously with the zoom gesture. So I recommend never putting more than one dot gesture on any one view simultaneously um, because it's slightly unclear sometimes what that would actually mean. Uh, so it's fine to put a gesture here and another gesture up here. They're on different views, right? That's on that view. That's on this view. But if you're going to put two gestures on the same view, you want simultaneously or there's another one here exclusively so that it'll recognize this one first before it would recognize this one. In our case with pan gesture and zoom gesture, they're peers, they can be recognized together is perfectly fine. So let's take a look and see how this works. All right, here we go, drag this in. Double tap, that's working. You can zoom, that's working. Want to get to the tree? Drag it on over. And this dragging works even if we're zoomed way out. We can kind of drag it around to where we want. Excellent. All right, that is it for gestures. That is it for this lecture for this whole week. Your homework this week is to make it so that when I tap on these little emojis, it selects them. And then if I have one selected and I do this zooming. Instead of zooming the back, it zooms the emoji up. But if I don't have any, anything selected, then zooming does zoom the whole document still. And similarly, when I have anything selected and I pick one of them up and move it, all the selected ones will move around to somewhere else in the background. 
But if I don't have anything selected, then dragging moves the whole document. And finally, I'm going to ask you to think a little bit about what would be a good UI for deleting one of these emojis. I want to get rid of this uh, thing. So you can think of what gesture or kind of what interaction with your UI it doesn't have to be a gesture necessarily would uh, be the best for deleting them. A little creativity um, injection there. And next week, we will really enhance our palette down here. Right now we have this one size fits all palette with all this kind of random stuff. We're going to add all that UI that you saw before where we can have named palettes and choose between them and manage them and all that. So we're going to be spending most of our time next week working right down here at the bottom of this. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.